Lovecraft was an internet figure long before that was even invented, because he almost had his own media. At the beginning of the 20th century, often people used to have amateur press journals of their own, which, if you like, is the equivalent of a website or a blog now, and they would disseminate this material in certain cultural circles, particularly in the United States, where there's never been any state law public provision for the arts until the Kennedy era, and where private patronage went essentially towards paying forms, the idea of, in a Protestant and frontiers manner, producing culture for oneself, or doing things and disseminating them, in the way Esri Pound did with his early volumes of poetry, was very much the vogue. And Lovecraft essentially published himself in small circles with others, and then through a, a publication that was called Weird Tales, in the 1930s and 40s, maybe the late 20s as well. Now, one of the interesting things about Lovecraft is that he, because fantasy and non-realistic literature, largely based on dreams and on phantasms and on nightmares, of course, in his case, um, both real and metaphoric, because that area was disprivileged, it was pushed down, down into not just popular culture or mass culture, but even lower culture in a strange sort of way. Um, and I want to talk just for a moment about the culture of displacement. Many cultural phenomena can never be destroyed. They can just be displaced. If you look at the cult of the heroic, and you look at certain classical and realist ideas, you look at certain pagan ideas, you look at certain ultra-masculine cultural conceptions, they have become so implausible and so disacknowledged within the post-war liberal dispensation that they've been pushed right, not to the margins of culture, but down, down into areas that critics don't even look at because they're beneath that particular sort of uh, trajectory. They're beneath that searchlight, if you like, to use that term. And uh, they're beneath that. And if you look at a lot of comics or graphic novels or things that children and adolescents read, fantasy, adventure, escapist literature of all sorts, you see certain primordial elements peeping out at you, often without any ideological or philosophical baggage at all, because these are entertainment-based forms, let's face it. Um, and yet it's quite clear that certain values are being disseminated by virtue of this type of phenomenon. Lovecraft is famous today because he was once despised, he is famous today because he appeared in pulp magazines, in the racks, in drugstores and supermarkets next to the chewing gum, and that sort of thing. Because teenagers would save their small amounts of money to buy these magazines that were printed on paper that was so thin and so cheap that it was cheaper than newspaper print. He's famous now, so infamous, because he was in Weird Tales. Most of the stuff in Weird Tales, of course, doesn't survive. Although it's interesting to notice that... Um, Robert E. Howard, who created a whole cycle of heroic masculine sort of figures who engaged in sword and sorcery type dramaturgy on the page, Conan the Barbarian and that series of stories is the most famous, but there were many before that. He's widely known now and is a sort of cultural brand in his own right. Um, Clark Ashton Smith is another one. And there are a few others, Dennis Wandry, a few others who have since have survived the demise of the magazine that gave birth to them. It's also true that modern capitalist, or post-modern capitalist publishing, likes a good seller and exists to make money. And therefore, the science fiction and fantasy areas, what H.G. Wells, when he created with Jules Verne, a form called scientific romanticism in the 19th century, now fills, if you go into Waterstones, or Borders, or any of these other bookshops, great sort of whole walls is full of this stuff because it is bought. The interesting thing about Lovecraft is it's quite clear that most of his horror literature is based upon the dream. And he kept a dream book by his bed and wrote down just the skeletons, all the tropes, <coughs> dreams, hand in lake, grabs child. <laughs> That's all it would be. It's a black fantasy, if you like. And from that, you embroider a short story or even a longish multi-episode short story. Horror and gothic fiction as the under the savage or blacker side of romanticism as a cultural dispensation is very suited to the short story form because it's intense, because it fo is plot driven, because it focuses around a denouement which reveals the reality of the tale and what has really been going on and closes it and therefore in an American sense gives closure. 
and also because it's concerned with externality, <coughs> things that happen to people and things that they fantasise about or configure before they occur. It's not given over to a very long, novel-length, discursive treatment of the inner mind, how people felt when these things were going on, and so on. Strangely, in horror fiction at the contemporary moment, you get these great triple-decker novels that are this thick and are written by James Herbert and Stephen King and these sorts of people. The interesting thing about them is that, from my way of looking at it, I'd only ever read one Stephen King book, and that's the one set in the hotel, The Shining, with the boy who has the second sign. And the thing that struck me instantly is that about 80 pages in, I realised that the hotel's alive, that it contains the psychic memory of all the people who've died there, committed suicide there, done something destructive there, that the building is sort of seething with dark and negative energy, that it will take some of the characters over and destroy them, and that will be the result. And probably it will blow up at the end. And I suddenly realised I've got to page 80. But there's actually 460 before you actually get to that moment. And it came into my mind that what King is doing is he's extending a short story out across 500 pages because his editor has told him that you've got to have a novel length, not a short story, because the horror form, the gothic form, uh, from Walpole, from novels like Vathek, from early 19th century literature from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, when the Byron Circle all sat round and they all had to give a ghost story. Remarkable set of stories came out of that particular evening. Um, Polidori's story came out of that. Her story, although Shelley said he cleaned it up and improved it. He did, actually. Um, and he did, yes, probably, actually. Yes. And she later wrote another novel, I think The Last Man was one that survived, and Oxford classics still do. But why is it that particularly our people find the Gothic form, find, if you like, the dark romantic form deeply attractive, as many of our people do, subconsciously, um, as I do. And I think, it's, um, I think it's because there's a strength to the capacity to dream. It seems quite obvious to me that people like Poe and people like Lovecraft and their other similar writers particularly short story writers, Oliver Onions at the beginning of the 20th century, Elizabeth Bowen, the Irish writer, who wrote some very, Irish ascendancy writer, who wrote some very crippled, gnarled, ferocious short stories. Perhaps the greatest short story writer of this sort is M.R. James mm -hmm. in the English tradition. who is a master at Eton all of his adult life. There seems to be not just the desire to dream, but the desire to make the dream strong in the articulation of it. And strength, in some ways, means going artistically, if only for a moment, in a slightly sinister direction before you draw it back to have a resolution. It's the sort of, the shadow that the tree casts gives you a three-dimensional insight into the reality of the wood. Uh, it's almost as if it gives a visceral quality to that which could be softer and ethereal otherwise. And without that balance, one can't find the centre. Certainly Lovecraft never wrote any of the stories for Manager Game, although he did do the odd bit of ghost game, although he did do the odd bit of ghost writing, and he, some of which is now preserved, I think a book of the ghost written material, the sort of touching up and receiving of a story and the recasting of it in his own imagination, has been published just recently. Lovecraft is out of copyright of course now, which is why there's a great plethora of this material in the last year and year and a half. His career began in sort of isolation and seclusion. He was an only child. His father died in Butler Hospital um, in 1898 in Rhode Island, Providence. Don't we hear in that name, Providence, the Protestant ancestry of New England, Salem, New Jerusalem, Providence, a people chosen by God, allegedly, leaving England to create a new world and a new dispensation. If you come from a town called Providence, you sort of know that you're part of the chosen, and uh, in a differentiated way. And he never lost that New England element to him. Uh, Lovecraft always regarded himself as a Briton, even as an American. He didn't like the American Republic, too modern, too new-fashioned, too newfangled. Those uh, people who didn't really care for Washington's revolution, um, some of them went to Canada, Others called themselves loyalists or Tories, 
and they lived on in the United States, ultimately became a sort of gentlemanly cultural opposition to the nature of the American Republic, are looking back to the British past, they're regarding that the United States was almost an extension of this country, that the theocrats who couldn't basically create a Protestant dictatorship that lasted after the Civil War and before left to create a new one on the other side of the world. Parenthetically, of course, although we're talking about H.P. Lovecraft, I always use these talks to uh, illustrate certain of the things that are going on. We now have the first decidedly non-European president of the United States of America. And it's interesting to notice that apart from maybe Patrick J. Buchanan, there's not one contemporary American politician who's seen this event for what it is. And this event is a defeat, at least a defeat for one definition of America, for a definition of America that's grounded in a post-European experience, for an America that is an expression of nation Europa, for an America that is a vision demographically and more importantly culturally of what they do towards European Americans. His victory is a symbol of what has occurred over the last 40 to 50 years, but also what the future holds. In most American cities, put rather bluntly, white Americans are in the minority now, or if they're not, feel that they are. And therefore, his election on Latino, liberal, white, black, and other votes is symptomatic of the way in which America has changed. Since the all-white immigration policy was done away with in the late 1960s, and it had lasted since the early 1920s, of course. Um, 70 million persons of colour have entered the United States and changed it out of all recognition. Now, Lovecraft's America was white to a degree that many Americans now couldn't even envisage. And yet he regarded it as appallingly decayed and decadent and miscegenated and utterly in racial chaos, and that was in sort of 1908. <laughs> so what he would have made of 2008, 2009, is quite unbelievable. On his first trip to New York, he said he was almost maddened by the seething whirlpool of the races and uh, the destructive intensity of a world crashing upon a city, because he was seeing it from somebody who was very provincial, from Providence, you know, he transported to New York, seething masses of New York, the sort of feel of energy as they come in from the Europe off the boats, and he sensed all that energy for both creation and destruction, and like all artists, would be appalled and it also excited, because energy always excites. And the interesting thing is that as his, Google, his Wikipedia entry, don't we all love Wikipedia, eh? His Wikipedia <laughs> entry testifies, um, Lovecraft, it says, had certain views of a racial character. <laughs> and that is true. That is true. He was influenced not just by Spengler's cosmology, of the undulation of cultures, of their decline, of their relationship to theories of plants, theories of growth, theories of decay. Uh, if, if that has any truth to it, that book that came out called The Decline of the West at the End of the Great War, we are truly in an autumnal period. Uh, but, as uh, my edition of Chambers Biographical Dictionary tells me, Spender's views are only a theory. So there we are. But Lovecraft was uh, strongly influenced by him, strongly influenced by certain racialist writers like Gunther and so on, but also by the nature and temperament of his Protestant, hierarchical, and culturally elitist experience. Um, as his major American Asian explicator, S.T. Joshi, says, um, Lovecraft was typical of his era, and yet more typical than many, because it's quite clear he had an ideological commitment to these ideas of decline and degeneration from which there could come new fulfillment and growth by virtue of reverse eugenesis, or cosmological change, or moral change, or social transformation, or little words and theories you wish to place upon it. Always an eccentric living at night like a sort of psychic vampire and writing gothic stories, living on a pittance, almost refusing to work because work was sort of slave morality, um, attitudinizing about the old aristocratic past, which his father had never really lived through, but of course the man is the writer of fantasy. His father died in the, uh, of nervous exhaustion, but he actually died of tertiary syphilis in 1898. His mother died in 1921 possibly of uh, an infection of that sort. There seems to be 
little congenital disturbance in Lovecraft. However, the family had died around him, and as a child they moved from quite august large quarters to a very small, crammed flat. This had a real impact upon the infant Lovecraft. Lovecraft didn't really go to school and educated himself, primarily in science. One of the interesting things about Lovecraft is that it would be easy to look at him as an eccentric artist and a writer of Wildean, Swinburnian, Edgar Allan Poe-like short stories, um, a sort of New England Gothic, as it could be described. But Lovecraft really was as much influenced by science as by the pedigree of artistic literature, whether they related to the Gothic era that he made his own or not. One of the other interesting things about Lovecraft is he wrote an enormous number of letters. Rather like the compulsive emailer of today, he would write 7, 10, 20 letters a day. His biographer in the 1970s, a science fiction writer called L. Sprague de Camp, what a marvellous name, eh? Mm -hmm. L. Sprague de Camp, sort of French-American, he wrote over 100 books, including um, some of the Conan cycle that he finished after Howard shot himself. Howard knew Lovecraft, of course. Howard was again an obsessive writer from Cross Plains in Texas. His mother died one day, so he took a shotgun and blew the top of his head off. Same day, when he was 30. And yet he wrote, before he was about 30 years of age, what many writers struggled to write in half a lifetime, and all of this stuff has been published uh, during the uh, course of the 20th century. But to return to Lovecraft, Lovecraft wrote over 100,000 letters, according to um, De Camp. According to Joseph's biography that appeared in the mid-90s, he wrote about 85,000 letters. But in any respect, he wrote an enormous amount. And many of these letters, because they're often quite famous writers that he influenced, and the letters went back and forth, are being published over time. He also wrote five volumes of essays, which have now been published um, and are available via Amazon and so on. Um, a cartoonist did an image of Lovecraft from early in his life, dressed like Poe, but further back. Dressed like sort of Poe, as Dryden, as Poe, with a wig, writing with a quill pen, because modern pens are just too modern, you know, um, with bats and various things in the background. The sort of the image appeals to his antiquarian bias, his 18th century bias, his Gothic bias, his image of himself, and so on. These uh, essays are gathered together in the five volumes, as I say. One is on science, one is on art and literature. One is on, one is the amateur press journalism, which if you like is contemporaneous material. One is on politics. He began, he began with a short sort of journal of his own called The Conservative. And rest assured that was indeed a conservative journal in 1990. And rest assured that was indeed a conservative journal in 1910. In America, of course, the word conservative has totally different connotations than it does on the European continent. Because we're so used to the centre-right Liberal Party being called Conservative, we actually have a sort of slightly anglo-centric view of it. In France, Conservative largely means somebody who philosophically rejects the tenets, not just of the Enlightenment, but of the politics of the French Revolution, which is in itself a radical or revolutionary position in relation to the last 200 years of French history. So the word Conservative has quite a different connotation in certain other cultures. It shouldn't just be considered to be, you know... The, the, the thing you call a party for people who've got a little bit of money, you know. Um, now, Lovecraft wrote about 30 stories, 32, 35, including some juvenilia. Three of them are long enough to be novels of a shortish compass. Now, many critics divide them into three. Um, the period when he's very much under the influence of Poe and Lord Dunsany and the Celtic national romantic tradition, slightly darker, it's almost like the equivalent of somebody like Bax in prose, this sort of thing. This is his early phase, um, more derivative in a way. Uh, the second phase is largely when he, the, the material becomes darker, stronger, uh, less prolix, less baroque, more visceral, and darker in tone. The third phase, the so-called cosmic phase, is when he introduces many of his scientific ideas into horror literature, and when he develops a new vibration, a new discourse, a new way of methodologically capturing that era of fiction. Traditionally, it dealt with dreams, it dealt with interpretations of reality that come out very much come out of the Christian cultural legacy, very explicitly. It dealt with diabolical possession, or it dealt with uh, sort of demonic forces, or it dealt with ghosts, or it dealt with the concept of guilt, 
or it dealt with the ambiance and sort of auric uh, manifestations of a place, uh, place, position, topography, very important in this type of genre literature because you're dealing less with fully wrought out Iris Murdoch-like presentations of personality, much more with mood and with atmosphere, mood within an individual and within the environment that they shape and are shaped by. That's why a lot of horror literature consists in a sense of building up an atmosphere of threat or plausibility or suspension of disbelief and so on, particularly if it's got any pretensions towards literature. Now, Lovecraft at one level could be considered as religious in the sense that his work is so fantasy laden and so imaginative that it transports people into other realms. That's why it's remained extraordinarily popular with, ad with adolescents. Adolescents often want primal answers, particularly about death and about human sort of the morphic, about decay, about radical things that people of a slightly more mature years don't wish to talk about quite so blatantly. Um, they also love escape and they also love adventure and the idea of violence, action if you like, appeals to them. I remember when Evelyn War was once asked, what was your favourite book when you were nine? He said, Captain Blood, because that's what you want when you're nine. <laughs> And, uh, but not maybe when you're 29. <laughs> now, Lovecraft, although he dealt in fantasy, was rhetorically and intellectually an atheist. He believed that the imagination was our way to freedom by virtue of the fact that we were imprisoned within normative worlds of materialism, of mechanism, but also of chaos. Quite early on, he imbibed an idea that the modernist movement was to exemplify in many ways, and that has become rather a cliche now, and is that order is ordered and yet seething and pulsating, as advanced physics allegedly tells us, with the prospect of dissonance and decay. The point of the artist in this particular rendition is to hold as much order as they can together amidst the seething, indeterminate nature of the universe. Now, if we're the prisoner of our genes, allegedly, if things are biological and morphic, if genetics, a term that wouldn't have been used in Lovecraft's intellectually formative era, of course, except by specialists, dominates everything. How can man be free in his own mind? How can he obscure the threatening nature of the universe? When Pascal looked out upon the universe and his great interstellar depths of chasm and so on, he felt estrangement and alienation. He felt sort of a cosmic coldness there. And partly admitted, at least to himself, as an internal reference point, that religiosity was not a way of dealing with that, as John Updike, who died recently, said recently, but certainly was a way through to dealing with that. Few of us really can configure that if our universe is one speck of sand in the Sahara, as certain cosmologists say, if that's what this universe is, and there are universes upon universes upon universes allegedly clustered together in various ways. If the human mind, really, only at the edges of consciousness, can completely conceptualize this, even if most of these are theories that may be mathematically true, but we don't know whether they physically are true or not, science in the future may determine that, may not. But Lovecraft's way of dealing with this, a very modern way, in actual fact, was to throw out the imagination was to throw out the element of fantasy in the mind, that which often in the child is permitted for a moment and yet is discouraged. You know, the child wants to draw, the child wants to paint, the child wants to dream. Don't do that, don't do that. You have to stop that and get real and sort of go into main adult life and any living and that sort of thing at a certain time. That's why I wanted to keep alive that facility of dream, to go onwards and to mature and deepen the nature of those dreams, both positively and negatively. Indeed, in a way, he's only arguing for what many artistic types really do, naturally anyway. Um, writing itself, in some ways, often for many people who write about the nature of writing, particularly fictional writing, whatever genre or area that they're involved in, talk about the resistance to doing it before you start, then talk about slightly disengaging from the most conscious part of the mind and allowing certain other things to come out. But this isn't stream of consciousness necessarily at all, because it's deeply structured, deeply ordered. You're dealing with different types of memory and different types of the reinterpretation of things which you've experienced and made up, even as you experience them. So quite complicated things are going on. The nearest uh, parallelism I can give to such processes 
is when you're in an exam and you want a fact, if you screw your mind up and you think, I must have this fact, I must have this name, day, name, date, and so on, you won't remember it. You won't remember it. But if you allow the mind to relax, which of course is difficult when people are under pressure, but if you allow that moment to occur, suddenly it comes back to you, just like that. Just as if a prayer has been answered because you didn't force it, because you used a different part of your mind. And in many ways, I think this type of literature, which is part about death, I think, I think Gothic literature is about death, and about how you place yourself before it, and how you deal with it imaginatively. Let's face it, the one human experience which you can never write about afterwards is death. So how do we pre-configure it in the mind in an advanced way? And isn't it also extraordinarily human to actually configure this ultimate topic as a form of play? as a form of entertainment. The people who like horror and genre and monster material and so on more than anyone else are adolescents, aren't they? And young people. So right at the start, you like the goriest type of material which you conceive almost as a joke to yourself. Partly, possibly, to hide the seriousness of some of the deaths that it can bring up. So some very interesting things are going on here. Um, I'd also like to mention that in relation to the culture of the far right, there's a strong influence from the Gothic, in many ways, particularly in contemporary culture. In a post-Christian society, which is morally dualist, and where the values are in a very humanistic way of Christianity have been secularised by liberals, as Aris Medic once said, we've kept the soft element of the Christian values and dumped the religion. And she's true. And she's saying the truth. In relation to the mainstream culture that we're in, and it's supervision by something like the British Broadcasting Corporation, for example. Um, now, in relation to that liberal culture, the radical right, and certainly forms of rightism, not as of the right of accepted conservatism, have been demonised. Have been demonised in a way that you would almost demonise a rival religious tendency of opinion since the Second World War. And demonisation works as a strategy. That's why it's adopted. It works. In a, in a way, um, but it also creates an enormous area of disfigurement, doesn't it? And fantasy, and illusion, because people are attracted to the darker side, even as they're appalled by it. So as you actually demonise something, you actually make it stronger at, a psycho, at, at certain levels of psychological resistance. It's noticeable that in this society there are two tendencies of opinion that can't be integrated. Um, there's a left, uh, there was a left-leaning form of modernism called surrealism. We had a talk about futurism earlier, which was, of course, Italian and vorticism that was British. But surrealism was French and had no connections with the right at all because Breton aligned it to the French Communist Party, Maurice Thorez, very early on. But there was a, as the surrealism broke apart as its leading gurus died after the war, such as Breton, situationism, as Maya Shard emerged. And this was the idea that all these tendencies are tied together that everything's the same, that everything can be made a joke of, that you go to the Eastern Bloc and people are selling you stuff out of the back of vans and cars, I thought this was petty capitalism, you know, there's youth gangs around, Anthony Burgess went to Moscow and was appalled at the social disorder, even under Brezhnev, and he based Clockwork Orange and the gang culture that he saw, not on the ghettos of Los Angeles, but on the ghettos of Soviet cities where they developed this language of their own to exclude adults and exclude the police, and this sort of thing. And Burgess was a professor of law, a lecturer in linguistics, and so I was incredibly interested in this. Now, situationism has the idea that everything's mixed together. There's a bar, it used to exist in Maidenhead, called the Soviet Bar. This is after the Soviet Union has fallen. You can go into the Soviet Bar and you can have a Dzhinsky. You can have a drink called a Dzhinsky. How many people in Barcha know that he was the founder of the Cheka? one of the major mass murdering organisations of the 20th century, where you can buy a drink and name after him in Berkshire. And that's because nobody knows. And they've not got Google in front of them, so they can't Google it before they drink it to be offended. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's the idea that something can be celebrated. The red bar, go in and have a red. And, it, and there's, a, there's a slogan at the back of the bar that says, drink as much as you want. There's a red flag next to it, and it says, drink and be with the masses, be with the people. They're making a joke of socialist realism, of pro coal. They're sort of spitting on it after it's fallen. It's been integrated. But there's two tendencies that can't be integrated into Western life, that where Debord's idea of the spectacle falls down. And they're the far right and what's called religious fundamentalism. 
They're the two areas that can't be drawn in. That's why this audience will consist of far rightists and some people who may or may not be considered by liberals to be metaphysical objectivists, which is the correct word for religious fundamentalists, if you like. And that's because these visions of reality can't be integrated into the contemporary PC. So the radical demonization of tendencies of opposition, um, the fact that with the British National Party, say, at one end, and his Terrier at the other end, liberals know that they can't be integrated. They're the, they're, they're sort of, they, they break their teeth on those. They can't be drawn in. But almost everything else, including the old far left of the past, can. This creates an odd energy because people are attracted towards that, towards that which is hated, particularly by power. But they're also revolted as well. So there's a division even in the nature of the attraction. Uh, people who've been involved in far-right groups for a very long time are aware of the psychology of certain of the haters, certain of the people who are most manifestly against, who are seething with anger whenever anything that could be attributed to the, the tendency that used to be called fascism comes up. There's a sort of Pavlovian moment of <laughs> hatred and fear and loathing. And yet often that's hiding and masking a degree of quite subconscious attraction, which is not a foolish statement psychologically. Otherwise, that superficial reaction wouldn't be as extreme. You don't you know, rage against something about which you're indifferent. And there's an, so demonization has all sorts of positively negative, queasy, but also genuinely negative formulations. It's also quite true that what's called the Hollywood Nazi element has done no one any favors at all. Because you don't have to be involved in the radical right for too long to realize that there is a small number of people of psychopathological tendencies and all the rest of it who are attracted because it's hated, because it's regarded as evil. Because I know when Winnie Mandela was demonized by the apartheid state, she used to drive around Soweto with a limousine, the new back elite you see in their limousine, and she had 666 painted on the bonnet because she exulted in being a demon because she committed many murders of rivals in the ANC and so on. She had a crew of her own called the Mandela Football Team who used to do it for her. You know, a necklace a day keeps Winnie at bay. So <laughs> <used to> say, <laughs> and, um, and how right they were. And she's even been excluded by the people who came in after the party, actually, in a strange sort of way. But <laughs> demonization, of course, does people a favor. It doesn't do them any favor at all. It's certainly true that it terrifies many people in the middle or of no views at all which is the majority of people in a Western society. I've got slightly off the track in relation to Lovecraft, but the idea of that which is demonic, that which is other, that which is incredibly powerful, that can't be mentioned, that can't be named, becomes a real force in Western society, and the literature of the satanic, the pseudo-satanic, and so on, outside of all religious constituted architecture, becomes very, very powerful culturally. And that's what's happened. In actual fact, of course, the far right is one of the three views, if you like, about how the West should be organized. The radical left-wing view, the centrist view, tending to the left, which in a complicated way we all live under, and the tendency of opinion that was defeated in 1945, although it's had other movements and so on subsequently. Um, so the demonic and the use of it in a dualist, very morally dualist culture is very powerful. When Nietzsche wrote Thus Spake Zarathustra, he brought back a Persian sage who institutionalized morally the idea that there was an absolute for evil and an absolute for good, and they warred forever. The Manichaean viewpoint, heresy in Christian terms, the basis of Pauline Christian morality, really. They needed a morality for this new post Jewish faith, so they found one. When Nietzsche wrote that book, he wanted this man from the mountains, if you like, to come back. This figure with a white beard and staff, you know, maybe a hat as well. Uh, an iconic figure in all cultures. He wanted him to come back and advocate non-dualism. The overcoming of the positive and the negative force and their institutionalization into one area. And in a way, Gothic fiction, you could argue, is in some ways a recreational entertainment-oriented version of that type of philosophizing, because in many of Lovecraft's stories, in many of Poe's, many of Hawthorne's, it's very difficult to see who's the hero and who's the villain. But the villain is often circumstances of God, if you like, it's, um, or it's something from the outside, or it's something from, that's very arcane. Even in relation to 
literature that's very much more of an explicitly Christian period, um, the idea that the destructive or the diabolical comes from outside is very powerful. But then again, if it's to come from the outside and into the inside of the human mind and purpose, there's got to be an entry point, hasn't there? There's got to be an asking of the force to come in. I remember at the beginning of Dracula by Janet Bram Stoker, Jonathan Harker goes to the castle. Remember that magnificent scene in Transylvania? Uh, and he's there and the Count appears. And the Count can't ask him in. He's got to ask for the door to open to all that will follow. He's got to admit the force, which of course is a religious idea, completely so. Um, but in other words, the force of destruction is will. There's a volitional element. It's come inside. I'm very struck whenever I think of the Gothic tradition in our own culture by the great Scottish novel, um, Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg, where at the end, after having built up the entire demonic character of this extreme Calvinist at a particular time in Scottish history, the devil appears, the devil makes a physical, or the devil is sort of construed in the narrative to have appeared, but if he's there, it's there, steaming and so on. But you can read the entire novel that was brought back into modernity, partly by the example of André Gide, who was fascinated by this novel, because it's psychologically plausible to the modern mind and ear and eye and insight and so on, before you have this sort of return to that which is otherworldly, that which is physically diabolical as the explanation for it all. For those who don't know this novel, it's about an extremist form of Protestantism, anti-Dominionism, which is a sort of um, power moral Calvinism, a pre-Sternite, pre-Nietzschean form of power morality. Don't forget extremist Protestant ideas, very close to Jewish forms of theology, the belief that we are perfect, that we are the chosen but if you say in a very ultra-Calvinist way, I'm predestined, I'm chosen, I'm the elect, can't you step out of Judas Christian morality? Morality is for the others, for the sheep. I'm of the elect, I'm of the glory, as this chap in the novel says, oh, my brother-in-law's got a bit more money. I need to dispossess him of that money because I'm of the children. I'm of the Zion. We stride over the others. I remember my mother was a Presbyterian, and I once entered a Protestant chapel, and they were all chanting, We are Zion, we are Zion, we are Zion. Now you know why Americans in the Deep South support the Israeli um, gunboats and planes as they bomb the Gaza Strip. Because in their own minds, they think of themselves as Zion. They think of themselves as elite. Because that wing of the Protestant religion believes those sorts of things. Now, Lovecraft came out of that tradition and was formed by it, even though he had a sort of cynical, an edge of the corner, uh, knowing an artistic attitude towards it. Because, of course, artists make play, as well as celebrating the traditions out of which they come. Conceptually, now in the West, people who create say they believe in nothing. They're just interested in everything, but believe in nothing. This is the new line, this is the mantra. When, of course, without any belief, there's no creation, because there's nothing you to rebel against. There's nothing there before there's creation. So when people say they create out of Western culture but don't really, really want it is, it means they're just stirring the top of a heap of dirt, don't they? Because they don't know where they have come from. And the interesting thing as we review Obama's election in the recent weeks is that people like Lovecraft, represented in America, that perhaps was a minority stroke, even minority minority experience to the lives of most Americans. But there is another America. There is another America. America is not necessarily Pepsi Cola signs everywhere and trash everywhere and so on. There is a tradition of Pound and of Eliot and of the First American Dictionary by Mencken and of the great literature that they could create that is an extension of the European civilization and its mission. It's not the, uh, it's not the America of MTV, but MTV is controlled by a different ethnic group to these um, Americans and what they did in relation to their past and any future that they may have in that particular union. I personally, although it's a long shot, it's a long punt and we're talking decades ahead, I don't think white people have much of a future in the United States, particularly. They'll be in a minority by the middle of this century. They may be armed to the teeth, they may have their condominiums, they may be able to move and all the rest of it. I was in Houston a couple of years ago and you can fit Texas in, it fit England into Texas 12 times, 12 times, and you can fit Britain 8 times. And you get a publication 
And it would talk about foreign news. Foreign news! And foreign news was what was happening in Oklahoma. Because <laughs> Texas is so big that the rest of the world is nowhere. You know, Henry Miller wrote an extraordinary book about the United States. It's very old to talk about Miller, you know, the great sexologist. But he wrote this book called The Air Conditioned Nightmare, which is an extraordinary book of an old European sensibility about the United States. He said, when you return from Paris to the United States, you know where you are, because at the first gas station, a joke, a chap will tell you, isn't it great to be back in the world, buddy? Back in the world! Because America is so big to many of its people inside it, they it is the world. They talk about themselves as the world. The rest of the world's nowhere. America's where it's at, and you better believe it. You know? And um, although when you're that big, when you're putatively an actuary that powerful, those are the sorts of beliefs that you will have. I mean, any group would have if it had amassed that degree of strength. The irony is, is that the intellectual brilliance of some Americans has been completely disprivileged, and a mass sort of low-level capitalist, lumpen capitalist metaphysic has been translated as what America is all over the world. The best thing that could ever happen to America in many ways is for all of their post-imperial power to collapse yeah. and for them to go back to being the United States, to go back to being what they always wanted that country to be, which was a country of people who'd come from Europe to get away from all of the infratricidal wars to build a new life. That's why the most patriotic people in the United States advocate maximum isolation from the rest of the world. That's why when Gordon Brown gets on the box, he says isolationism is a great peril and a great danger. These protectionist people, these British jobs for British workers, his own slogan, of course, these terrible people who want these sorts of things, American isolationists have always wanted it. The radical right has always wanted it inside the United States, whatever it's been called. Black America, who has always, until now, loathed the dispensation of the American state internally, have always wanted never to be involved in any foreign conflicts at all. America, probably the last war they would have meaningly fought was the one against Spain, the one over Cuba at the turn of the 20th century. After that, American isolationists would have kept out of almost any other war that didn't relate to the Monroe Doctrine and to what they were hemispherically. Now, to return to Lovecraft, yeah, Lovecraft was, uh, began as an Arianist and as an American first and up to a point, but didn't like Theodore Roosevelt because he wanted to go abroad. He wanted to manifest American power externally because by the beginning of the 20th century, America was getting very twitchy and would increasingly to be not just in the Caribbean or Central and Latin America, but all over the world. They tried one great attempt to intervene, of course, at the end of the First World War when Woodrow Wilson adopted a liberal mantra for American global hegemony, and then there was a resigning from that, there was a retreat. Nothing is forever. America retreated from globalism once. There's a very, the most famous, one of the most famous history books written in post-Second World War America is called Ascent to Globalism by Stephen E. Ambrose. It's totally mainstream, all of its views are utterly Harvard and CIA appropriate and so on. But it's interesting because it's such an insider's view. And the idea that our empire declines, of course, we once ruled the world quarter of the world in 1908, well, look at us now. And our power was pretty straightforwardly taken from us by the United States, who've ruled in a neo-imperial way since. This is why American cultural figures, post-European figures in the United States, are so culturally important. Because whether they're obscure or whether they're mainstream, if they become mainstream, that culture is ventilated all around the world. You know, his books are in every bookshop in the world. Every bookshop in the world. He died when he was 47, almost, of semi-malnutrition. Because Lovecraft was so poor at the end, he was living on baked beans, uncooked. Pretty bad. Pretty bad. I, even if I was there, I'd have said, look, Howard, you know, you are starving to death, but couldn't you think better than cold baked beans? I mean, something, <laughs> even a candle can heat it. Even that can heat it. Like, well, put a tin there, boy, you know. Um, cheese. And bits of old bread, that's what he was doing. Oh. So, in a strange way, it's how the uh, aristocratic sensibility has declined in the United States. Because if you have an extraordinarily upside, gifted individual who can write great big thick books of no commercial value whatsoever, who's not an academic, who can't make money, and whose family inheritance has gone in a world where if you can't make money, you're nothing in the United States and where the only class that they had of a higher sort, the slave-owning, southern aristocratic class, has gone down in the 1860s, been completely destroyed 
in the war to end war within the state. And when I was in Texas, you realize pretty quickly people don't, from the South, call the American Civil War the Civil War. You say the Civil War, and they say, what's that? And you say, oh, you know, the Civil War. And they say, no, nah, the war of aggression between the states. The war of northern aggression against us, or the war between the states. So it's very important, first of tribalism. America's not one country, it's many countries. Every tendency, every race, every culture, every religion's there now. Um, so the America that Lovecraft addressed was largely a sort of organic culture, Inca with the blacks accepted, in comparison to what it is now. Now, Lovecraft's later phrase, which is called cosmicism, is when he thinks of enemies of the human coming from the outside. This has led certain people to compare some of his work to some of Evola's theories. It's always said, and I remember well, in a, book, a, a female academic from Northern England, a Jewish woman called uh, Jill Seidel, wrote a book called The Holocaust Denial. It was published by a very obscure press about 15 years ago. And she said something very interesting in that book. She said, all right-wing discourse is an attempt to build hierarchy, and is an attempt to justify inequality, and is an attempt to exclude by virtue of its hierarchical ordination. And that is a totally truthful statement. That is a totally truthful statement. It's one of those moments when the outsider sees from the outside the truth of the discourse. Why do right-wing sensibilities do that? Because they want to create order. There are then definitional there are then debates about where the order comes from. And of course, there's two great <laughs> views. One is the order is prior, and is metaphysically objective. In other words, there are outstanding truths outside time, outside history, outside man, outside his circumstances, that they are divine. But humans don't, maybe necessarily in their individuality, know everything that pertains to the truth of that, but they are prior to man. That's one of the views upon which you base the idea of a civilization. Not it's all made up, you know, I just thought of having it today. That's called heuristic thinking. You make it up as you go along. The other great sort of polarity, which is a more modern one, is people in a sense who can't accept the religious verities of the past. Don't forget, almost everyone in a Western society has grown up in a society where the religion has crashed down around them. It just doesn't exist. I grew up in, I was born in 1962. You know, the Christian religion was, the, even if I had any partiality in that direction there anyway, was, was dead have been really dying for at least a century, in my mind, in the mind of many young... Now, in this situation, the one we are now, people of a rightist bias, if you like, in the last 200 years, somebody like Charles Mouin, somebody who founded the Action Francais, thought, I may not know what the absolute truth outside of this life that I experience is, but I can still support order, and I can still support that which is given, and I can still support prior structures that lead to hierarchical inequality. Why? Why? Because they give meaning. Because they give meaning, because they lead to transcendence, or the idea of transcendence, which is the metaphorization of hierarchy as you go up. Why do you want that? You liberal would say, why? Why? Why do you want all that? You want it because it makes life deeper, makes life more three-dimensional, makes life more real, makes the prospect of death more real. Well, why do you want that? You want that so you can be more alive. Then they stop saying, why do you want that? Because it's become rather obvious. But he said, oh, but that's that will lead, in some ways, to a tragic view of life, or to a more profound view of life. And one of the modern conceits is to have things at such a low temperature, and everything's so boring, so nice, so compartmentalised, you're feeling depressed, well, shock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, um, that's, that's what life's about now, uh, in the West. The irony is many people from cultures outside the West look all on at us from the outside and think we're all ninnies, and we've all bought what goes on here. And the truth is, of course, that the bulk of people have accepted liberalism because their prior religious tradition has collapsed for many of them, and they're lazy, and they're enmeshed in materialism, and they're enmeshed in materialistic lives. You know, it's the sort of thing, if their credit cards are taken off them, they'll be crying. Our Marines are crying when the Revolutionary Guard takes their iPods away. <laughs> Many of them. I tell you, if I was running this country, and then you train those Marines would be crying. <laughs> the Marines themselves. But there is a degree to which, if you like, a constructive, non-religious based view of right-wing thought is also valid in this sense, because if a prior hegemonic religious viewpoint is collapsed, 
Many left liberals would argue, just plump for what exists now. Safe, utilitarian, global, market-based, we're all the same, we all want the same things allegedly, we all want to shop, we all have the same desires, and after in every street, you know, this sort of thing. But in actual fact, we're not all the same, and we don't want all the same things, and we don't have the same dreams or desires. And sort of love class literature is about some of those dreams and some of those desires. <coughs> In closing, particularly for people who've never read him at all, I'd like to, to look at one story in particular called The Dunwich Horror, which is very interesting. It's about 60 pages long. And Lovecraft builds atmosphere amazingly in these long, archaic and baroque sentences uh, that seem to go on for almost too long. You know, The story is about an eccentric backwoods, backwoodsman who's a black magician and it has a sort of sabbat or circle up by these stones in the heath. Uh, because he has such a sort of sabbat or a rosa imagination, he, uh, Lovecraft could see a nice wood in sunlight, and what he sees is gothic gnarled trunks and the prospect of human sacrifice in the woods. <laughs> That's what he sees, when in actual fact it's a sort of nice sort of Woolworths postcard is disarmed, you know, in the sort of, um, in his imagination, because he sees things in this dark sort of a way. And the story involves, always, always with Lovecraft, even about his fellow Americans, conceptual elitism. Because there's this attraction to the barbaric, the instinctualism of the lower orders, and also this moral revulsion as well. And also they're the ones who will allow in the forces from without. And there's this decayed family, decayed genealogical line called the Wapies. And uh, it's quite clear that this sort of... A, malformed woman in the family, allegedly has some sort of congress with a being of nethermost essence from without. And she has two children. And the, the husband, who's, uh, the uncle who's left, creates a dwelling inside the house where he locks all the windows and he closes them down and he builds a wooden structure on top of the house. The idea of an extended padded cell, if you like. This is a very much a staple of Gothic literature. Uh, it was always said the old British aristocracy had always, you know, the big family chain, you'd have one who was mad. One who was utterly insane, you know, but you wouldn't have him in the black wagon dragged off to the local asylum. You'd build a padded cell in your mansion for him, you know, is that Jeffrey screaming? You know, and he'd be there. <laughs> he wants speeding again, you know, approaching the long pole. And that sort of thing, that very English sort of British way, you know. And in a way, this sort of literature is like the sort of formulations from that room, you know, at a distance. And so he builds this structure onto the back of his barn. And there's two brothers that have come from this illicit congress, that <coughs> speak from without. One can be seen, and he speaks this sort of hick dialect, you know, this New England hick dialect, I'm going out in my buggy, he's sort of dialect, you know. Um, and he's always very tightly dressed, tightly dressed. The idea being that there's bits of him that could slip out that you wouldn't want to see, you know. <laughs> bits of him that aren't human, you know, particularly from beneath the waist, you know, the old idea that the, of the hooves and what is above them, you know. And every time he winds down to town to have a chat, to have a jaw at the local drugstore with a few of the characters who prop up these stores, you know, you know he, he's very careful about his diction, about his um, way of behaving, about holding his trousers up, as of course you would be if you were half demonic, nether and straight down to the local store to obtain provisions. I mean, you know, put yourself in the chapped place, you know. Um, then he gets in his buggy and he drives back up to the family farm. All the time there's incessant tapping and knocking from the creature inside the extended wooden balustrade that's wanting to get out. And of course, there's always a professor in Lovecraft stories of Miskatonic University or the University of Arkham or something like this. And he was saying, I'm very troubled by these stirrings amongst the peasantry out in, out in sort of, yes, in New England, Arkham Town. Some very primitive underformed types out there were engaged in some very strange rituals after dark. I heard tell of some strange mongrelization involving things from without. Things that can't even be discussed. Strange tappings at night. Wooden promontories and extensions of these clapperboard dwellings. I tell these to my colleagues, but they think I'm mad. <laughs> no, 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 they think I'm totally insane. But I mean to, I mean to quest out these, these provincial outposts and wreck them in, you know? And it's always Lovecraft's personality as the academic bachelor of means, 
who wants to go out and see what the dark sort of side of the New England peasantry is up to. So, of course, things take a pretty turn when one of the brothers who's sort of half morphic and a shapeshifter and semi diabolical and a bit of a goat, <laughs> getting the picture, but dressed up like sort of black and white minstrels and so on, breaks into the Miskatonic University to look at a forbidden volume. Lovecraft loved, like all bibliophiles, he loved what post-structural critics call intertextuality, the fact that one book leads to another book, leads to another book, leads to a reference in a footnote that leads you back to another book, so you become completely in sort of imprisoned, uh, a glorious imprisonment in the world of books. There's a sort of, mar in some ways, a sort of anti-fascistic novel called Alter de Fay, written by Ellis Kennedy, about a crazed bibliophile who lives increasingly surrounded by books, and the books get closer and closer, you know, um, so that they're toppling over him, and they're almost sort of animate things about to destroy him, and he needs his crude housekeeper to keep the knowledge at bay. You know, it's a satire on the mind-body split in Western civilization, where intellectuals become so lopsided, almost they topple over, because the physical bit gets this small. But with the Watley, in comparison to the brain, but metaphorically, but with the Watleys, this demonic family, he breaks into the university to consult the Necromicon, this book that um, Lovecraft made up, of forbidden law, written by a mad Arab, you know, can imagine it, mad Arab, with the sort of, and the ink is the sort of, I don't know, the sort of, the inner sort of blood of a tarantula and so on. And the chaps, the mad Arab is writing these sayings that the nether gods are telling him in, in spidery hand. It's marvellous stuff, you know. And uh, Watley breaks into the library because I just got to get what that crazy old Arab was into because I feel something's coming, you know. Something's <laughs> coming and I've got to see this book, you know. And he's caught in the university library, sort of transgression. He's caught trying to get this volume. Translated in Lovecraft's field by John Dee, who was a famous magician and famous writer in that area of pre science where magic and classical law and extreme learning and arcana and sort of madness all seem to sort of gel around in one sort of area. And how a backwoods peasant who's got goat hooves could read Latin written by a mad Arab <laughs> is not dwelt upon because, of course, in this literature, you don't, you know, details, that's for the critics, you know, that's the, the Edmund Wilsons of this world, you know, not the adolescents reading this sort of stuff. And he's, and he's right there all down, he said, you yeah. um, he said, uh, all these sort of signals and strange terms that when he speaks to his father, his father, the old ones, the ones out there, uh, at the Sabbath, he's going to bring down other glee by which again, it's the simple ones left at the turning with the cart who see it. As his, as, um, the, half, the sort of half-brother morphic form, the other thing that was mated at the Sabbath and hidden in the farmhouse by the wooden extension and then burst out, they're the ones who see it, not the intellectuals. And they come back and the sort of, the New England um, rural citizens are on the ground, rolling around said, oh my god, oh my god, I saw it, I saw it, I can no longer see. You know, it's like, it's like sort of the binding in Lear in reverse, you know. Uh, and uh, the professors asked them to recount in their own words, which gives Lovecraft the chance to do the sort of hick dialogue that he loves, about what they've seen. And one of them, sort of, you know, a couple of whiskeys down the throat, and a tie released and so on, he says, I saw it, man, I saw it. He said, he came out of the, house, the, of the farmhouse, big like a clown. He said, but brown, brown, and it wasn't human. You understand? It wasn't human at all. It was writhing snakes. Snakes are fresh, and they were grey, going on pink. And each, each hose pipe, each thing had a sucker. Had a sucker, like a mouth at the end of it. Some of it was green, and some of it was violet. Some of it was brown, some of it was some sort of colour you don't want to even think of, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and on top of it was this great sort of a disc. A disc, it was a metal disc. You know the sort of chooseness of the academic mind, that when they're being told about an enormous monster coming out of a farmhouse, they want to sort of get it down what sort of disc it was on top. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. He said, I don't know, Professor, some sort of a disc, you get me? And it was coming out of the farmhouse like this. But that wasn't the worst, and then he was going, not the worst, boy, not the worst. He said, no, he said, on top of this disc-like mongrel entity of flesh and suckers, there was a face. Oh, you a face. He says, yeah, it's even worse than the face. He goes, god damn, what's worse than a face? And he said, on, a, on the top of a critter like that, boy, what's worse than a face is half a face. <laughs>
<laughs> because it's got half the face of its brother on top of this great seething mass as it goes up. And, and then the professor ends his tale by saying, I know that my fellow academics will not believe what has occurred. I know it's the testimony of simple backwoodsmen. I know that for many of you sitting in your hearts and boots, Stories of farmhouses exploding and releasing demonic taint with half faces on top of host pipe blown commange is not your cup of tea. <laughs> but I am saying, as Jesus is my witness, I, well, I didn't see actually every moment, but it was recounted to me by a man who knew and he saw. Because people, there are, there are evil people out there, like the Wattlers. And they want to bring in these things from the outside. And it ain't permitted, do you understand? It's not <laughs> <laughs> bring them in without a buyer or leave. He said, we came here to New England, he said, to build a new world. To build a new world. And these low-grade peasant types with their primitive folk religions are bringing in these creatures from the outside. But I tell you, the professors of Miskatonic will stand against it! Well, that's all right then, isn't it? You know, the idea that they will stand, stand against sort of nether forces of the dark that are always brought in by those who are more primal. And then the story ends. And it's a sort of, uh, and hence, but the Dunwich horror, which is the horror, the thing at the end, or the half-brother who isn't quite human, <coughs> or the breaking into the museums, get the sacred straight blasphemous book that will release in more of those things. And this sort of thing. And um, there's a great moment at the local store when the uncle, who's helped sort of give birth to these monstrosities and this sort of thing, uh, comes in, helps with the birth, you know, and chats at the local store. And he says, oh, yeah, I've got some people in my family, he said, the like of which you wouldn't believe. And he said, the like of which you wouldn't believe. They weren't even human. Indeed, they're better than human and worse. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yes, and people extrapolate. Marxian, deconstructed thinkers, thinkers, love off really talking about some of the people he met in New York and that he didn't like very much. Or is he talking about civilization decay? Or is it a complete fantasy where it's just a dream, straight nightmare, and has no reading beyond the text? It has no reality beyond itself. Who knows? What we do know is that Lovecraft died penniless in 1947, and yet, no, in 1937, at 47, and yet a publisher, of people who admired him, many of the people he'd sent the emails of his era to, thousands and thousands of times, all of his correspondents, clubbed together to create a publisher called Arkham House, who brought him out over the last 20 to 30 years. And then he gradually became a more and more significant figure. Uh, even the great sort of popular novels, I knew somebody who... Uh, actually printed Stephen King's It, I think. Six million were printed in Britain alone. Six million. They run the presses at um, uh, which is Bungie Clare, well, one of the very, very big um, printing firms in Britain. They kept them on 24 hours, never stopped. Six million. As I always think to myself whenever I hear that figure, it's so amazing. <laughs> 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 that figure always returns. <laughs> It's in the most inappropriate places. It just seems to come back like a tick. But um, there's a sort of. But King has said of Lovecraft that Lovecraft is the greatest uh, writer of the baroque and highly wrought literary horror of fiction in the 20th century. And in a way, it's true because he creates his own world. You go into it. You sort of know what you're going to get. Um, other stories are very poesque. There's an early one called The Outsider, where a man sort of meets himself in a mirror and has a denouement thereby, the self-reflective moment. Um, it's a very old, sort of um, classic, sort of gothic fair. There's a few extraordinary ones, which I'll close with. One is the colour out of space, where this force comes from without, it's like radiation, and infects this farm. And they all decay. And there's great lines in it. But there's Uncle Wilbur sat by the fire with a little pipe, you know, that sort of thing. So his, pipe, his body falls off. And one of his relatives, one of his nephews, goes, Wilbur, what's happened to your arm? And he goes, oh, shucks, it's, it's gone and fallen off, you know. And it's there, because they're all turning to dust under the radiation. This colour that comes from without. And the interesting thing about Lovecraft is that the monstrosities are sort of pseudo-scientific. They're like radiation. Remember the scientists who developed the American atomic bomb? Yeah. And they used to chuck bits of the inner machinery to their children 
because they knew very little about the concept of radiation. They all died of cancers in about 10 years later. There's pictures of them from the Washington Project. There's one famous picture of one of them holding up an inner component from the bottom. He's holding it on his arm's head. Thinking, gee, look at that. You know, smile. You're on Kodak. You know, she'll be dead in a couple of years. You know, it's um, because they didn't know. And therefore, to write a story like The Color Out of Space, which deals with the fear of radiation, before that was even mentally known, is extraordinary impressive, isn't it, really? And that's why I say that, in a way, people like Lovecraft, and the tradition that he represents, are dreamers. Are dreamers. You can, there's the old theory <coughs> that Colin Wilson once uh, put in one of his books. It's a theory that sometimes works, although there's no scientific basis for it. If you have a face before you, photographically, you look at the left eye that looks at you, because it's said that that indicates the inner personality. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, no, it's not scientific, but policemen still use it. It's very interesting. You look at the right eye, that is allegedly the personality it's, as it's configured for presentation. It's the world. It's the mask, as they call it in Eastern cultures. It's that which you wear. The left eye indicates the inner personality and that sort of thing. And it's very odd. If you look at many poets, there's an enormous development of the eye, of this eye. A sort of, it's just a way of looking at it. It's just even an artistic way of sort of looking at an intuitive way of looking at these things. But Lovecraft's eye is that of somebody who's not entirely on this world, as mentally he wasn't. A dreamer, a visionary, partly mad, partly sort of glorious, but very much part of our tradition, I think. This capacity for transcendence and a capacity for a sort of Saturnalian and darker element to the notion of that transcendence. I think it's visionary power in art. I think it's uh, the greatest things that we've achieved, tragedies usually, the greatest things that we've culturally achieved, <coughs> the Elizabethans, the Greeks, they deal with this sensibility and its power. And I think that when one sees an advertisement for a mobile phone, or one sees some egregious Americana that one doesn't like the look of, you always remember these other figures. People like Lovecraft, like Poe, like Pound, like Lewis, although he was Canadian by birth, like Elliot, often ultra-European figures with their dicky bay ties and all the rest of it, from the early part of the 20th century. And we understand that there are many Americas, and that we feel spiritually closer to the one that they represent than the one that Obama represents. Thank you very much.